Welcome. Thanks for tuning in. So glad you've joined our Linden Road online worship experience. And we want to say a special welcome to you if this is your first time. And would invite you to click on the digital connection card up above or leave a comment here in the chat or down into the description here. You'll find a similar link to our connection card where we'd love to get your email address and your name. And if there's a prayer request you might have or if there's a question we might be able to answer. But we're grateful. Certainly hope it's not your last time. So thanks for checking us out. And if this is your spiritual home, we say welcome to you too and are grateful that you've joined our Linden Road online worship experience and would invite you to use the same connection card or scroll down into the description here on YouTube and uh, let us know your prayer request or if there's something that you want us to know here in the building. And so we're grateful too that you are here and grateful for your faithfulness. We want to share that this week we celebrated the life of our good friend, uh, Shirley Smith. Shirley was uh, an amazing presence here in the last seven years. Such a joy to be uh, in in her fellowship. She uh, surely grew up here in Mansfield, and she left after high school and college and went out to uh, have an amazing life of adventure, everything from being an airline stewardess to uh, getting her pilot's license. She had a Volkswagen bus and a teardrop camper that she and her husband traveled in and just what an amazing life and we're sorry to lose her. Uh, But she lived a life that was full and that we're grateful that we had a chance to be part of her life and so just going to give tribute to that. And then earlier this week was the National Day of Prayer on Thursday and here in Mansfield there was a parade actually uh, from the St. Luke's Point of Grace on Marion Avenue to the gazebo downtown and then there was a time of prayer there praying for the community and for our elected officials and it was such a blessing to see the kingdom of God manifest itself in that way and to show the community that the church capital C church here in this region is vibrant and is wanting to seek God in all things again grateful for the leadership that made that happen And so as we continue our time here this morning in worship, let's begin first with a song that will encourage us to worship our God. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering, though there is pain in the offering. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glory. Lord, 
Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glory. So we're in week nine here of our series called uh, What's in a Name, where we're looking at these I am statements that Jesus made about himself. And we're going to wrap up today with this final statement of his uh, where he says, I am the true vine. And in the passage we're going to look here in the book of John, uh, Jesus is going to unpack for us the idea of abiding in him. And it's interesting that this is where we land. And then in all the other things that he lays out about himself, this is the one that probably is the most important, that helps us navigate all that life is giving us as his people. And he introduced a concept, we talked about it last week, where he mentioned that he was going to his father's house, and his father's house had many rooms. Or as we looked at it, we were reminded he's not really talking so much about heaven as he is about places where we can abide with him. And then Jesus, in this week's message, as we look at it and wrap up, he unpacks that again, revisits the concept, and he gives it a new metaphor where he talks about the vine and the branches. But before we begin, let's begin with a time of prayer. Father, we want you to be our dwelling place throughout all generations, but we confess that we are not very good at remaining in you. We're distracted and we're hurried and we're running breathless sometimes after so many other things. And so today, help us to slow down and to abide only in you. And we pray in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. It's been quite a journey, hasn't it? We've been leaning into this series now. This is our ninth week. And today we're going to wrap up. And we've been talking about what's in a name, where we've been looking at the I am statements that come to us out of the gospel of John that Jesus calls himself. For us, I think probably even more important is that he began each one with the phrase I am. That statement would have meant a lot to those that he was walking with, those that were Hebrew, because it was the ancient name of God. It was the name that was revealed to Moses as God spoke to him in the burning bush, Yahweh. That that, that word is a form of the verb to be. And so here we have Jesus saying seven times where he identifies himself with God. The first I am statement was, I am the bread of life. And then we looked at I am the resurrection and the life. That was our Easter message. And as we looked the next week at I am the light, that was the Sunday before the great solar eclipse of 2024. And then he said, I am the door or the gate. And then the next week, his statement was, I am the good shepherd. And then last week, we looked at this idea that he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so today we're going to look at the last of the I am statements And it comes to us out of the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. Here the reading of God's word. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as also I remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself and must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. He says, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. 
So let's do a little background here on this passage. Jesus and the disciples have just left the upper room and they're en route walking through Jerusalem toward the Garden of Gethsemane. Here in chapter 14, 31, just before this passage, he says, come now, let us leave. And as they go on their way, I'm certain they must have passed by the temple, the temple complex, where I'm wondering if Jesus would have seen the large sculpted vine that would have been on one of the outer walls. And I'm wondering if maybe he would have pointed to the temple and said, I am the true vine. So again, as we think about the context of this story to us that comes out of the gospel, it would have been grounded in an ancient understanding that the audience would have uh, embraced. So here are these words from Isaiah, the great prophet, uh, chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. It's entitled, The Song of the Vineyard. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it out of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and he hewed out a vine vat in it. He expected it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now inhabitants of Jerusalem and people of Judah judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I expected it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it shall be devoured, and I will break down its walls, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed. It shall be overgrown with briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the people of Judah are his pleasant planting. He expected justice, but saw bloodshed, righteousness, but heard a cry." It's interesting as we read the scripture to be reminded that throughout the whole Old Testament, we find the nation of Israel is often portrayed as the vineyard of God. It's a very familiar picture. But now what's interesting, once again, Jesus comes along and he changes it all up. And now he's saying something that is going to give a whole new perspective. He's saying to those that are there with him, his disciples, that the new Israel is the spiritual fulfillment of God's promise. And what does he mean by that? Well, he wants us to see that one is connected to the true find through Jesus. And it's not something that goes through the family lineage of Abraham, that really it's about Jesus, that everything revolves around him. So what I want to do today is I want to focus on what it means to abide in Jesus. Because I think one of the great challenges to our spiritual life right now, I believe it has been for a while now, is how all of us are time conscious as human beings and we're trying to relate to something that is timeless, and that's God. And that we live under this tyranny of the clock, right? And that God himself inhabits eternity. So the psalmist says to us in chapter 46 and verse 10, they that wait upon the Lord. But you know what? I think all of us, if we're honest, we, we, the idea of waiting is really something that we don't like to deal with. Why? Well, obviously, because it takes time. And so for most of us, the great danger is not that we will walk away from our faith. The truth is, I think, for many of us, that we're going to become so distracted and rushed and preoccupied that we will settle for a watered-down, mediocre version of our faith. It's interesting. I've had a couple conversations this week with individuals one works for a faith-based company, and as I was talking with them about some business matters, uh, turned the conversation to just, let's talk about life. And I was curious just to get a better understanding of this person and even their faith journey as they talk to churches all the time. And it was interesting that this person, guess what? They are, are not a church person. Uh, church is not something that's part of their journey and their story. And I was intrigued by that, partly because just the season we find ourselves in. And then uh, another time this week, I had an opportunity to sit with a former student. They're now living a life uh, far from here, but they were home to visit. And it was interesting in the conversation with them too about how important their faith is. At the same time, at least in this season, they're not connected to a church. And yet these things that we're all trying to figure out, just the, the sense of anxiety and the sense of just all the disconnect that seems to be in our culture, even this week as we watched what took place 
because of the, the Palestinian and the Israeli issue on the college campuses, things that are just unsettling and wondering just how are we going to weather this next season? And we, we have had this conversation. We did a sermon series a while ago, and I'll put a link here to the worship notes, about the ruthless elimination of hurry. If you don't remember that phrase, the ruthless elimination of hurry, came out of a conversation with two of my mentors. Uh, one I've met, the other I've only read about. So Dallas Willard is a great theologian and practical kind of guy. He wrote a lot of books on spiritual disciplines and how to do this thing called faith. And his student, John Ortberg, who uh, at the time was beginning to take over the leadership at Willow Creek, John called his mentor, Dallas, and said, what do I need to do to lead this large church in Chicago, uh, this very large church of thousands, tens of thousands of people? And there was a long silence and pause on the phone, and Dallas simply said, you need to ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. And Ortberg said, hmm, that sounds pretty good. Number one, I'll write that down. And as he pondered, he said, okay, so what's the second one? And again, after a long pause, Dallas said, there's nothing else. As we try to lean into this current season, we find ourselves in coming up on another election cycle that looks to be fret with all sorts of uh, difficulties. It's not surprising that Ortberg went on to write a book entitled The Life You've Always Wanted. And one of the things he identifies in that book, and I think it came out of his own story as well as he was leading this great church in, in the Chicagoland area, is what he calls uh, the d disease of hurry sickness. That the truth is, and when we think about all the things that show up on our television screens, right, that there's also these things that we will buy that offers to promise us uh, some way of reducing the hurry in our life. I mean, think about it. Uh, we want to get shampoo and conditioner together. Uh, it'll save time in a step if you're washing your hair, right? Do it all together. Or Domino's Pizza. Maybe you'll remember that they say they don't sell pizza that they sell delivery in uh, 30 minutes or less, guaranteed. And then McDonald's, right? We don't buy it because it's necessarily good for us, or even because it's inexpensive for the most part, although fast food anymore is not inexpensive, it seems. We buy it because it's fast and convenient. It used to be you had to park your car, go inside, sit down, and eat, but that's not the way it works anymore. In fact, most uh, McDonald's actually have two drive-up lines that sort of converge together, and they can handle twice as many people, and I know the one that's just around the corner here from the church. As I pass it on my way to the church or as I'm leaving the church, it's always stacked up, and I'm just wondering, man, where were those people 10 years ago? Now, it's this idea of hurried sickness. Uh, let me offer a definition I found. It says, it's a continuous struggle to accomplish or achieve more and more things or participate in more and more events in less and less time. Frequently in the face of opposition, whether it's real or imagined, from other persons. What are the symptoms of this disease called hurry sickness? The first would be constantly speeding up our daily activities. The reading and the talking and the eating. I mean, even with podcasts now, it's very easy with a podcast app. You can take and have it read to you at two, three, four times its normal speed so that you can get through the book quicker or the podcast quicker. Or maybe you've played that game as you're driving in your car, whether you're riding or driving, you're pulling up to a traffic light trying to determine which way to get away from the traffic light quicker. How about the idea of counting people in the grocery line when you go in to check out, pondering which line will get you in and out. Even today, the issue for many of us is that many of our retail stores have gone to self-checkout. And even that, there tends to be a line, and there really isn't any other way but to wait. This idea of the frantic nature and pace that our life seems to be moving in. And also the second would be this idea of multitasking, something that has become very much a part of our culture. We used to call this just doing one more thing at the same time, but yeah, that takes way too long to say. So now we just simply say multitasking. And the truth is, many of us do it best in the car. The truth is that people who are hurry sick are people that can drive and eat and shave and put on makeup and drink coffee and listen to the radio, talk on the phone, and even make hand gestures and do it all at the same time, right? Crazy. And there's this third point of being superficial or superficiality. The truth is that going deep can only come slowly especially in relationships or in conversations, and even in our thoughts. We have to take time to ponder and reflect 
and engage in order for it to go deep. But the truth is what's happened in our culture is we've traded wisdom for information and we've actually traded the idea of going deep for going wide. And that's a problem. That's resulting in a lot of the disconnect we have in our culture right now. And then finally, probably the most fundamental of all these things, this uh, hurry sickness uh, brings about an inability to love. Because to be honest, uh, the idea of love and hurry, these ideas, they're fundamentally incompatible. The truth is that if you're gonna love someone or something, that it's gonna take time. And time is the one thing that if we're hurried, we don't have. We don't have the time to do that. And so that's why this idea of hurry is the great enemy of the spiritual life. It's impossible for us to be aware of our Heavenly Father's love when we're always in a hurry, buzzing around, trying to get things done. We've got to stop and ponder. So what's the cure for hurry sickness? It's real simple, and Jesus wants to offer that to us today. It's abiding in him. In Luke chapter 10, we're going to take a look at a story that we know. Here in the building on Thursdays, we, in our Bible study, we've been doing the, the book, Being in a Mary and a Martha World, unpacking just the real insights of just how busy uh, Martha was and yet how uh, connected Mary was and the tension between the two of them. And again, let's take a look at this story. Luke chapter 10, verse 38 begins, Now as they went on their way, he entered a certain village, where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part which will not be taken away from her. And that's sort of surprising, I think, for many, right? That Jesus actually commends the attitude of Mary in the story as opposed to her sister Martha, who's busy. So what do we have going on here? Well, Martha is in the kitchen and she's doing all the things that need to be done because she's got guests in the home. In fact, I wish we could show the clip from the season that where this conversation actually takes place in The Chosen that's so beautiful where we see the tension and what needs to take place and how to slow down and the beauty of that and to be reminded of that because Martha's just running around and she's trying to figure out uh, how to carve out the swan centerpiece from a you know, watermelon and, and she's you know, working with her computer to print out the festive designs to put on the napkins and the, on the centerpieces for the table and she's using half an apple dipped in the mixture of food coloring to really make a beautiful impression on, on the napkins and wow, all that to say, doesn't Mary just tick you off in this story? Couldn't she be more engaged? Couldn't she be helping here instead of being a hindrance? And there's work that has to be done, right? Somebody has to do it. There is all this work that just has to be done. Now, it would be interesting if you would in the chat here, uh, tell me, are you a Mary or are you a Martha? Are you one that can sit and, and sit at the feet of Jesus? Or, or are you busy, busy, busy? And it'd be fun, just put in the chat here, because I think most of us tend to be a Martha. We tend to rush, 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 and really what Jesus is wanting from us is to take and just sit in his presence and to soak in his love for us as his sons and daughters. But this is what Jesus is talking about here in John chapter 15. He's talking about this idea and this importance of abiding in him. And so he leans into this imagery of the grapevine and the idea of the branches that are growing out of it. And he says very clearly that he is the vine and that we are the branches. And interesting enough, Jesus then ties in the practice of abiding in him with this idea of being productive, uh, being fruitful. Again, John chapter 15, verse five, he says, the one who abides in me and I in them, this is the one who will bear much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Think about that. Think about the tension between those two attitudes. Martha, she is busy and hurried. She's wrapped up in a frenzy of activity. And this is truthfully the posture of most of us that we're familiar with, right? It's our culture right now. Buzz, 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 run, 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 go, 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 do, do, do. But you know what? Mary is doing the simpler thing. She's sitting at Jesus' feet, 
And truthfully, this is the posture of one who is a true disciple. It almost reminds me of the kindergarten classroom, right? And almost as Jesus is speaking, where he says uh, in another part of Scripture, unless you change and become like little children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So here, let's get practical. How do we do this? How do we sit at his feet? How do we abide in Jesus? There's four things that I want to suggest, four practices that we need to make sure are in our life. And I know you're not gonna be surprised by these uh, because we've talked about them before. But again, I just think because of just all that we're in, right now I'm walking through a season with some pastor friends through a book that a fellow pastor by the name of Alan Falding has written. He's out at uh, Mariner's Church in California. It's called A Non-Anxious Life, Experience the Peace of God's Presence. And we've been meeting the last number of weeks on a Zoom call and just unpacking for just an hour. And it's just amazing how for all of us, it seems as though this season we're in is all about trying to unpack not only for ourselves, but even for our people that we're serving as shepherds to, uh, the people in our church, the people in our youth group, the people in our community, that we need to cultivate very deliberately four practices. And the first, you won't be surprised, is scripture. You've got to read it every day. And again, I want to suggest, you know, join us on the YouVersion Bible plan. Uh, join us for an, a one-year Bible experience. You're going to find that what we need to do is move from reading for information, but we're actually reading for formation, spiritual formation. When we're doing informational reading, we're doing all sorts of things that are talk about things that are possible. But what formational reading does for us, it covers what is needed in our story. It helps us to focus on going deeper. It's not about the quantity, because it could be just studying one word, one particular understanding. But when we talk about informational reading, what is it all about? Well, information is all about the goal of mastering the text or the content or, or the meaning of the text. But formational reading has the goal of being mastered by the text, reading the scripture to have the scripture pour into us to help us see what God wants for us as his children. The idea of informational reading, it treats the text of the scripture as an object. But this idea of formational reading, it sees ourselves as the object of what God wants to do and how he wants to form us. That the formational reading can impact how we see ourselves. The idea of informational reading is all about analytics, whereas formational is about uh, reading to receive. And then finally, informational reading seeks to solve problems. But formational reading seeks to enter into the mystery of God and understanding what he's doing and what he's asking of us. And then beyond the scripture is this idea of worship. And so glad that you're here to experience our online worship experience. So wish that you were in the building with us. But this medium has become very helpful in the many uh, weeks and months since all of us leaned into an online worship experience. It doesn't replace being together, but it can certainly help encourage us. And so the idea of gathering together, even here online, to invite others to watch this later uh, through the link here to the, the YouTube uh, channel or uh, to share it through the podcast. The idea that we come in the moment, even here online, to encounter God, the living God, not just to critique and compare, but actually to know that we're much like the children in kindergarten as we sit there waiting to be taught, sitting at the feet of Jesus, much like Mary did. Because we want to be reminded that he is really present with us. He's present with us through the Holy Spirit and that we need to learn to attend to him like Mary did. And then the third point is this uh, idea, concept of fellowship, the idea we do need to be together. We're told that wherever two or three are gathered in his name, he is really there with us. And what we need to see is that he, he is present. And what we need to see is he's present through the lives of those people that we're doing life with. As we encounter Jesus in each other, then we can be the body of Christ and be the church and make a difference in the impact of those that we come in contact with. Just like last week, again, we had the opportunity to serve our neighbors help those in need. And actually last week we served about 70 people. Uh, there was a little more there than normal. And uh, at one point we were afraid we we're going to run out of food, but God provided. There he is. Yeah. Hey, good to see you. Good to see you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.
A blessing it was to meet the needs of those here in our community that uh, are in need. And then finally, the idea of praying. Prayer is the, f the fourth component here, that we need to be in prayer. And in fact, we're reminded, right, there needs to be a regular time of prayer. So again, is it in the morning for you or is it in the afternoon? But also be reminded that Paul told us that we're to pray continually. Remember that verse from 1 Thessalonians 5.17. We're supposed to have an attitude of prayer ongoing every day every moment of every day asking God to show up and to show through us in the way of bringing his light to others let's let's wrap up I want to tell you the story about brother Lawrence he wrote a book called practicing the presence of God and he was the patron saint of all the Marthas in the world those of us that just don't have the ability to sit like Mary in quietness and contemplation at the feet of Jesus he lived for 15 years in a monastery and one of the things he struggled with was the discipline of the structured prayer times they had there. I've been to a monastery. I can tell you the time of prayer in a monastery is complicated. It's uh, early in the morning uh, before the sunrise, and then it's at sunrise, and then there's three more times during the course of the day as you lean into a practice of connecting with your Heavenly Father which again is another reminder here for the pause app of being reminded that a couple times a day, you just need to stop and be connected with your heavenly father. Now, again, with brother Lawrence, he, he wrote for a long time, I felt like a failure at prayer during these structured times. And he continues, but then I realized that I would always be a failure at prayer and I began to feel much better. Okay. That's great. I mean, I love these kinds of statements because that's me. I feel like I fail at, prayer all the time. So I'm glad to know that I'm not by myself. And what's interesting is that our friend, Brother Lawrence, he, he was in charge of a busy kitchen for the monastery. And this became his lab, if you will, laboratory for learning to live continuously in God's presence. And what's interesting in that setting, in the kitchen, and it might be the same as Martha's failure to choose the one thing that's needed. His teaching on prayer is summed up and he makes these three simple points. First, God is closer to us than we think. Second, no one sees anything of our prayers. So nothing is easier than to repeat these little interior acts of worship throughout the day. And the third point, we can make our heart a prayer room into which we can retire from time to time to converse with him gently, humbly, and lovingly. And then he says, I do this simply by keeping my attention on God and by being generally and lovingly aware of him. So perhaps his greatest success, our friend Brother Lawrence, is this observation simply being, my fixed times of prayer are no longer anything other than a continuation of this same exercise. And so as we wrap up this series on Jesus in his name, and the names that he gave himself, the great I Ams, I can't imagine that there isn't any better place to land the plane. This exhortation for us, as we think about who he is, for us to abide in him, to abide in Christ. For what we've learned here, right, is who he is, about all the things he's provided for us, 
and how he even lives with us. And so probably the most basic idea as we wrap up is that we're invited to abide in him forever. We are invited to abide with the great I am. He that is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He that is the Alpha and the Omega. He that is the Prince of Peace, the Messiah, Emmanuel, the God with us, right? As we talk about it at uh, Advent season that he is with us forever, that it's just one long continuation of being with him over and over and over again. And so let's pray. Father, we're grateful for this truth. And Jesus, we thank you that you do want us to abide with you. You invite us in. So give us a heart like Mary's that is not wrapped up in our busyness and our hurry sickness, but rather in abiding with you. Send your Holy Spirit to equip us to that task, to love you well by being with you and sitting at your feet. And help us then be the hands and feet to those around us to see the hope that you offer. And we pray it in your strong name. Amen. Let's continue with a time of worship through the song, The Great I Am. close, close to your side, so heaven is real and death is a lie. I want to hear voices of angels above, singing as one.
again, what a beautiful reminder that he is the great I am and what he's done for us. And because of his good work, we're reminded that you have been blessed to be a blessing. So go forth and serve Christ in his name. Amen. Have a great week.